for the hardest hitting show in talk radio. The true progressive voice since 2012. This is South Pause. Welcome to South Paws on the Pacifica Radio Network. We are the leaders of the revolution. My name is Darren Gibson, and I'm your co-host. I'm Katie Steele. And I'm Jack Prince. Boy, we got quite a few things to talk about. We want to talk about the police with drones and priests in Grand Rapids. (laughs) What an odd combination there. We have a dual hammer time segment coming up. We want to talk a little bit about the testimony earlier this week from the Capitol Police and whatever else we can find. So let's get into it real quickly. Before we start, a couple of reminders. You can follow us on social media by going to facebook.com forward slash South Paws Radio Show. You can follow us on Twitter at South Paws Radio. You can follow us on Tumblr at South Paws Radio Show Tumblr.com. You can follow us on YouTube by doing a search for South Paws Radio. You can become a patron of the show by going to patreon.com forward slash South Paws Radio. And I apologize to everybody out there. I had no idea the Patreon was down until a listener got a hold of me over the weekend and said, hey, I'm trying to help you guys out. Apparently, if you don't log into your Patreon account as often as they want you to, they shut it off, and then you have to go through the whole process. So apologies there. Again, patreon.com forward slash South Pause Radio. You can listen to the show anytime you like at Spreaker.com or Stitcher.com by doing a search for South Pause Radio. You can find us on Apple Podcasts by doing a search for South Pause. Once you found our logo, you found us. We send links to our weekly episodes to our Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, and YouTube accounts. You can listen to us on Global Community Radio Channel 1 every Saturday night at 11 Eastern. And you can listen to us on great Pacifica stations, including KCEI in Taos, New Mexico, KZGM in Kabul, Missouri, WOOL in Bellows Falls, Vermont, and KEPJ in San Antonio, Texas. So, Please listen to us on your local Pacifica station. And if you have a local station in your area, please donate your time and or your money to them. They could always use a little bit of both. I kind of want to start real quickly. We received some news this morning that former Senator Carl Levin of Michigan passed away yesterday. He was 87. Apparently, he was diagnosed in March, or he announced in March that he was fighting lung cancer, which I had no idea. Carl Levin, a big champion for unions pretty much his entire career. Yeah, he was. Went after a few corporations, too. Yes, he did. I actually have this. This is Mike Householder, Corey Williams, and David Eggert writing for the Associated Press out of Detroit. Former Senator Carl Levin, a powerful voice on military issues in Washington and a staunch supporter of the auto industry back home in Michigan during his tenure in the U.S. Senate, has died. He was 87. The Harvard-educated civil rights attorney and former taxi driver, who for decades carried his faded 1953 auto union membership card in his wallet, died Thursday, according to his family. A statement from the Levin family and the Levin Center at Wayne State University's law school says, quote, We are all devastated by his loss, but we are filled with gratitude for all of the support that Carl received throughout his extraordinary life and career, enabling him to touch so many people and accomplish so much good, end of quote. He was first elected to the Senate in 1978. He represented Michigan longer than any other senator. Some of the things he fought against included tax shelters, He supported manufacturing jobs and, unfortunately, pushing for military funding. But I will say that he did vote against the Iraq War in 2002. Important note. Yes. His tenure was a testament to voters' approval of the slightly rumpled, down-to-earth Detroit native whom Time Magazine ranked among the nation's 10 best senators in 2006. A Washington insider and former prosecutor known for his professional bearing Levin took a civil but straightforward approach that allowed him to work effectively with Republicans and fellow Democrats. 
He was especially astute on defense matters thanks to his years as the top Democrat on the Senate Armed Services Committee. And he didn't fear speaking his mind. He was in the minority, even among his Democratic Senate colleagues, when he voted against sending U.S. troops to Iraq in 2002. And two years later, he said that President George W. Bush's administration had written the book on how to mismanage a war. He gave a cautious endorsement to President Barack Obama's 2009 buildup of troops in Afghanistan, but later warned of the beginnings of fraying of Democratic support. He was also critical of Ronald Reagan's buildup of nuclear weapons, saying it came at the expense of conventional weapons needed to maintain military readiness. Famous for wearing his eyeglasses down on his nose, Levin seemed to be the same candid, hardworking guy wherever he went, whether he was in front of cameras on Capitol Hill, on an overseas fact-finding mission, or lost in the crowd of a college football stadium on game day. A foe of fraud and waste, Levin led an investigation in 2002 into Enron Corporation, which had declared bankruptcy the previous year amid financial scandals. The probe contributed to a new federal law that requires executives to sign off on financial statements so they could be criminally liable for posting phony numbers. Levin pushed legislation designed to crack down on offshore tax havens, which he said cost the U.S. government at least $100 billion a year in lost taxes. He was also an advocate for stem cell research and gun control. Closer to home, Levin promoted policies benefiting the auto industry and supported giving $25 billion in loan guarantees to General Motors and Chrysler. He argued that a vibrant domestic auto industry was crucial to rebuilding the economy after the Great Recession. He also was a member of a task force supporting efforts to fight pollution and other environmental problems affecting the Great Lakes. He was born in Detroit June 28, 1934. He stayed in Detroit most of his life. After high school, he spent time as a taxi driver and worked on an auto assembly plant lines to help put himself through school. Always proud of having helped build the DeSoto and Ford trucks at a plant in Highland Park, he held on to his UAW union membership card for decades. That was until his wallet got stolen. He earned a bachelor's degree in poli-sci from Swarthmore College in 1956, a law degree from Harvard in 59. He married his wife, Barbara, two years later. They had three daughters together. By the way, he was Michigan's only Jewish senator, hmm. which I really had no idea. Democratic Governor Gretchen Whitmer called Levin a champion for Michigan, adding, quote, He saw what we were capable of when we came to the table as Michiganders, as Americans to get things done. Carl devoted his life to public service. It is up to us to follow his example, end of quote. He did write a memoir called Getting to the Heart of the Matter, My 36 Years in the Senate. That was published in March. So uh, his brother, Sander Levin, was in Congress for many, many years. His nephew, Andy Levin, is now in his father's old seat. So there is still a Levin in Congress to this day. I met Carl a couple of times in my life. Uh, the first time was when I was 13 years old. I uh, rode a bus with my dad and a bunch of his carpenter union buddies to the Labor Day parade in Detroit. This would have been, I believe, 81, and met Carl Levin there. Mm -hmm. Later on, I met him when I was working at Wood TV. He came into town. He was taking a tour of Drukey Games over on the west side. For, for those of you that don't know, Drukey used to be one of the biggest manufacturers in the world. I think they were the number one in the world of manufacturing wooden chess games, chess boards and pieces, and hmm. backgammon games. Wow. I don't even think Drukey's in business anymore. And the last time that I ran into Senator Levin, I was covering the farm bill uh, when President Obama signed the farm bill at MSU uh, for this show. So sad to see him go. He, yep. uh, like I said, a champion for union workers everywhere. Hmm. Um, rest in peace, to Carl Levin. I just want to say, though, I'm just going to say this dissenting opinion really quick, that a union champion that died worth over $2 million while income inequality has gotten mm -hmm. two points that are unsurvivable for the rest of the world. So yep. I just want to be careful about, you know, once again, holding up our millionaire white men that, no. that well, continue to oppress everybody else, even no. though... You know, they do their best. A lot of times they do, and it's not. My there, criticisms there have been, are. There have been senators with more money, though. That's, oh, there are. There always yeah. will be. But I guess my point is 
we got to set, we got to draw a line, right? We got to draw a line and we got to actually Let's, hold these people to a standard instead of going, there's worse because there's always going to be worse. Yeah. So and I just think the standard needs to be, I don't deserve anything more than what they're getting. And exactly. I don't know how anybody can sit in office and take more than that. So I guess that's why. And I know that's not stuff people want to talk about when somebody dies, but maybe we should. Yeah. And that's a line that we should have drawn decades ago. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And, and enforced decades ago instead mm-hmm. of, of just letting it go. Speaking real quickly of uh, unions, we've uh, failed to mention this the last couple of shows because we've run out of time. But the strike at Frito Lay in Topeka, Kansas is over. Workers. With the Bakery, Confectionery, Tobacco Workers, and Grain Millers Union, Local 218 approved a contract on July 23rd. Uh, They get a 4% pay raise over the next two years. They are guaranteed one day off of work each week. That's the problem is that they went on strike because Frito-Lay was making them work 7-12s. But, I mean, here we are how many years after fighting for the five-day work week and eight-hour work, and we're fighting for less than that now? Yeah. This is not a win for the union. It's a win for the company. Exactly. That's my thoughts on it, too. I'm so tired. Like, I'm, I was actually just reading in a pamphlet that I picked up from the Grand Rapids Public Library. It's called Grand River Valley History, and it's put out by the Historical Commission. This copy was put out in 2005, 2006, but it was focusing on the labor unions in Grand Rapids. And I didn't realize, but at one point in 1886, Grand Rapids actually had 7% of the entire nation's membership of the Knights of Labor. Oh, wow. There were, even the mayor, uh, senator, there were so many people here that were pro-union. And that that was how, um, when they did the eight-hour workday push campaign in 1886, one of the most successful cities to strike was here in Grand Rapids. We had thousands of people hit the streets and refused to go into work. And they don't talk about that now. We hear a lot about the furniture strike of 1911, Mm -hmm. which didn't turn out so well for the workers. But if you want some encouragement, there's local history here that... Sometimes yeah. turns out okay. Yes. Well, my background with the unions, my mother was a vice president of Clark Equipment's union, and so I was raised in a union family. I was dismayed in my experience as a teacher, though. The uh, teachers' union had its teeth pulled out and its claws pulled out when it was made illegal in the state to protest yeah. to st- or to, to go on strike. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I did not see in 30 years of education where the MEA ever confronted that legislation. Because without it, you might as well have uh, no weapons in your arsenal. And uh, yep. there's two ways to end the unions. One is it just ideology can just tell people they're not good and they're communists and all that. We've seen that. But the other one is to go inside the union and sell away power and take the make it into a top-down uh, organization instead of the bottom up, which right? It was and using an agency which is, like the Democratic Party is a great way to do something like that. Wh- which which is seen. unfortunately happening happening right. at many many unions. Every yeah. union. Let's be honest. Yeah. I mean, I don't see any right now that are actually effectively making change, and that's what's sad. Is that I think we'd be better off organizing outside of unions mm-hmm. at this point. <laughs> because that's where the workers are. That's where that's where the, the grassroots movements always I, come from. Exactly. I, I I would argue IWW is probably not pretty aggressive. Top yeah. down, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, they're so big though. I think that's how do you organize from something that's already that big and established if they're not top down and they're not already organizing us? Yeah, and the, and the pro- the other problem is is that there's been so much consolidation of unions over the last. 30 years, 40 years, 50 years that it's just not even, you you can't even recognize the union anymore. No, I mean, UAW is representing all of our public officials, even though we don't even have manufacturing here anymore. It's all very strange. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's really, some some of the unions that represent certain trades is just absolutely bizarre. It's like, how did you get involved in that? It's because (laughs) they don't really want it to be effective is what I'm guessing. Like, whoever Mm. it is that strategize these well, decisions. Well, I'll tell the story real quick. And I, I grew up in a union family, too. I've talked about it on the show before. My dad, 42 and a half years as a union carpenter. He was vice president of his local. 
Uh, my oldest brother is retiree of the International Union of Operating Engineers. My Trump-loving former middle brother was a former laborer and was also in the APWU, American Postal Workers Union. Uh, so was I at one point. Uh, much like you've had criticisms of the MEA, I've got criticisms of the APWU protecting bullies. Mm-hmm. And for that matter, not really standing up for their workers. But I don't know. What do you do at this point? Well, the concept I of think the union we, I think is... I think we need a general strength. Is what we push need. back to power, you know what yeah. I mean? But yeah. what we have in reality, I think Katie's alluded to this, is an alignment with power. Mm-hmm. You know, Absolutely. they sat in these country clubs uh, negotiating... Administration offered a cigar to the guy representing the union, and the next thing you know, hey, you want a drink? Where does mm-hmm. it stop? It's I simple. Mean, where were you? I on Super Tuesday, I went down to the uh, Democratic Party watch party, mm-hmm. and who was down there? Every Democratic Party official, all our public officials who are elected, and all our union leaders sitting at the same table. It's not mm-hmm. a coincidence, and. It's not a coincidence that we still are fighting for less than what we had 50 years ago. Yeah. The income inequality is worse than it was 50 years ago. It, it's all on purpose. And so the more we play into these systems and the more we go, oh, but they're going to hire me to be a part of the solution. If I go work for this 501c3 or 501c4, yeah. I'm going to fix everything. No. You know what you need to do is go work for McDonald's and organize the people there for free. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. For free. Tell them not to Don't come tomorrow. Yeah. No vacation. Yeah. No, I know. Yeah. yeah. And then you help each other and you get through it until... Until you get somewhere, and until you do that, until we do that, we're, we're screwed. I, yeah. can't, I can't keep telling people to support unions. Don't. I was a union rep, yeah. a teacher's rep for my building, and um, the president of the union at that time, this is a local Grand Rapids union, teacher's union, the GREA. Mm-hmm. He told me, well, you know, Hunt, the, the administration offered him a job, and it was more lucrative than the job that he was in, even though he made a higher wage than any teacher mm-hmm. i said okay you got to resign he thought i was kidding i said no, you got to resign anything you do now in negotiation i'm going to be suspect that yeah. you're trying to keep alive a good relationship and someday cash in on an easy administrative job right you have to resign he couldn't get it well, i'm not going to take it so it doesn't make any difference everything you do now is maintain it yeah yeah people can't see tomorrow they can't <laughs> yeah I'll just end it on this point. Something, again, I've said on this show repeatedly. If you're a member of the union, number one, you need to go to your union meetings. You Uh, must go to your union meetings. You should talk there, too. Exactly. (laughs) Because guess what? Power comes from the membership. That's the way it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And if you don't like the way that the union is being run, you need to run for office and get rid. be a firebrand. If you walk in there and you don't understand something or something sounds fishy or suspect or not fair or not right, say something. I guarantee you 99% of the other people in the room were thinking the same thing. Nobody wanted to say anything. And you're going to find out you're right. A union is only as good as its rank and file. It was that way when my dad was uh, the VP of his local 45 years ago. It's the same today. All right, we might as well just get right into some local stuff here. Uh, Oh, God. Boy, is the Grand Rapids Police Department really just trying to expand their reach. If it isn't trying to get the priest on their side, then it's getting drones. So let's take the Jack, priests let's first. Take the priest. let's, uh, let's get the angels before we get to the <laughs> drones. Okay. Here's the deal. I know, I realize that the image of the Grand Rapids Police or all police departments is at the lowest ebb in, uh, in decades. And they're also being challenged with the defund, the very active and aggressive defund GRPD group here in the city. Right? So what do you do? You go out and you play softball with the local kids, mm-hmm. or you hand out suckers, at, or you get the you re- clergy, <laughs> the black priests. ministers of South Grand Rapids. Oh, yes. That's the power structure. They learn that from you know who, DeVos. Oh, yeah. Who yep. go and he, give them chocolate giving covered them strawberries. Money for years. Yeah. To so keep if them you can get that. them somehow affiliated with your name, you, when you can wash away a multitude of. Of sins. Oh, yeah. I'd like to read something real quickly. The cops shouldn't be giving religious officials official joyrides. 
The Freedom From Religion Foundation is emphasizing this directly to the Michigan police chief. It was mailed. Several Grand Rapids residents have informed the state church watchdog that the Grand Rapids Police Department is launching a new faith-based partnership called Clergy on Patrol. The purpose of the program is to foster a relationship between police and faith-based leaders. That quote is from the police department's PR system. The bottom line is that they are in violation of, and I have it here, the actual constitutional language. This is against the law. We do not hire ministers to come into our classrooms as public school teachers. Jack, where are you reading that from? I am reading that. From in here, I'll let you uh, actually take a look at it. I'm I'm missing much of really excellent language. You may want to read that. Ah, our good friends at the Freedom from Religion Foundation who have been on this show before, but we probably need to get them back on again real soon. <laughs> wow. Hey, FFRF does fantastic work. They have shut down religious programs in schools all across this country. But how stupid does GRPD think they can put their hand well, in a cookie jar and not get caught? It, they're, they're, they're calling it clergy on patrol. And I don't know if you saw their second statement. They edited their original post. They yeah, changed they did. it. Yep, yeah. they and they said to. there have been some misunderstandings and mis, um, like basically accusing people of purposely making it sound like... Like they were saying something they weren't. When in reality, yeah. they're calling it clergy on patrol. And then they come back and edit their post and say, it's not like these guys are really going to be on patrol. <laughs> it's not like they're but really trained in using force. That's what you just either. said. <laughs> right. Yeah, they're, and, yeah. they're like, it's not like they're going to use force either. We're just training them to. What? Yeah. 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 What? Right. Hey, here's the force. We'll keep our guns in the holster. You bring the holy water and sprinkle the shit out of these kids. Just throw that holy water out there. It's war, like the that, exorcist, that right? That sounds great, but I'm pretty sure it's going to go more like this. Oh, accidentally shot the clergy and the guy. Oh, our bad. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And you know. You think they care about those black clergy leaders? No. No. Absolutely not. That's a great way to get them all out there at the same time. It's two birds, one bullet. Yeah, pretty much. This is despicable, though. It is. I uh, was in a summer school class as a teacher for GRPS, and I heard next door somebody talking about abstinence as the key to reducing teen pregnancy. <laughs> what in the world? We oh, is that? Yeah, and we know. come to find oh, out we knew. The, the churches here in town volunteered to come in and teach sex ed to public school students in a public school. Can you believe it? When, when we confronted the Franklin Street, it's like they didn't know anything about it. Oh, we don't know. It was gone in a day. They were out in a day. And sometimes all you have to do is bring to attention to the GRPD or the GRPS. This is against the Constitution. Very clearly stated. I mean, I don't understand how they've gotten away with a lot of things they've gotten away with, though. The city of Wyoming does prayer meetings in their official city meetings. I mean, they pray. Bef how yeah, is they, that okay? They, they start with a prayer. How, uh, that is in a direct violation of church and state. Yeah, it's the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law with respect to establishment of religion. When a local government has a prayer that is giving preference to one religion over another, it's a violation of the First Amendment. Right, and what, what about atheism? What about all these other weird pagan? And Are they going to have these leaders out in their cars too? Something tells me they're not. <laughs> Atheist leader. This is one I would love to find. <laughs> uh, I'll be. I'm, I'd like to volunteer <laughs> for a ride along. <laughs> there we go. I mean, it wouldn't be my first ride along. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. But maybe they'll let me sit in front this time. <laughs> oh my god. Well, oh. well, you may not have to do ride alongs. You can just operate the drone can that they want to get. Can we talk about the fact though that these are the same people who have been accused? and I'll say accused because they're generally never investigated, of molesting our kids. Sexual abuse is rampant talking, in the church. Talking about the clergy, so that's not the okay. police. Oh, I don't well, know. Probably although, both. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Who's investigating them, right? Nobody's investigating Nobody. either, so who knows? But Well, the police are. They have their I own know internal that the affairs. The police have turned their damn head on everything <laughs> the clergy has been accused of. Mm -hmm. They're totally okay with those accusations. They'll well, still put those guys in the car in the seat right next to them. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think Jeff Smith wrote another bombshell article about the union with the uh, the clergy. 
you have to realize that we have had the plea from uh, many quarters in the United States to take trained professionals out into the cars who are trained in de-escalation, although the police should be, and they have counseling, uh, psychiatric help, et cetera. Then you don't get the kid blown away in his front of his house in East Grand Rapids uh, who was autistic, was wandering around the front yard, uh, and the police, you know, they I see a you... nail, they pull a hammer out, right? Mm-hmm. Why can't we have some substitute for... Because the truth is it won't make a difference. No, it they'll make sure. It won't make them less they'll, violent. They'll make sure. No, I mean, mm-hmm. even... I, I don't think there's any way it could. I think that this is a system and that this is... This is a culture that putting another person in a car with them isn't going to change it. It's not going to fix it. And if they do that and everybody sees that, there's only one other thing we can do next. Yep. Abolish the police. They can't risk that. Which Minneapolis is about ready to put that right. on the ballot yep. coming up. They've, they've already approved the language. I think the only person that voted against it was the mayor, but... Hey, we're, what what it what it would do? It's scarier for them because the language is. What it would do is it would change Minneapolis. They would abolish the police department and then replace it with a department of public safety. Well, here's my concern. That's going to where are all the those same people going to come from? They're going to come from the Minneapolis <laughs> like police that's department. That's what the public. That's what the police is supposed to be. The department of public safety. So that doesn't sound good to me. I think what we need to do is, I, I love how this is turning out even though i'm constantly pushing for more and saying this isn't enough this isn't enough this isn't enough because the more we talk about it the more the language gets now people are actually saying no i want to send out mental health professionals i don't want to send out a cop i want to and i don't think it'll work i don't think it'll make a difference no but until enough people call for it yeah and we try it nobody's gonna see that so i do like that it's being talked about now and it's scaring the hell out of them do you mind do you mind if i read a little bit of jeff's piece from grid Oh, no, not at all. I had it, but go ahead. Before you start that, though, have you ever gone to Menards or some of these parking lots and you have these guys that are retired? They're not even, they were never police. It's mom and pa, and they're about 65, right? And they can give you tickets. Yes, the ones that, like, do the handicap spots and stuff. They, like, yeah. police those spots. And- yeah, but the problem is they've got a cop's attitude. You would think they were. it's Barney Fife on steroids. You yep. know what I mean? Yep. They come up to you like they're going to arrest you. Oh, yeah. But Barney Fife was nice, and he never put his bullet in his gun. He carried it in his pocket. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Vigilantes, oh, come on. Yeah. It, not even. Cause, <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Don't even get me started on that. Let me let me read this here. This, this is an excerpt from uh, Jeff Smith's great article at grid.org, G-R-I-I-D.org. For those who have been involved in monitoring and resisting U.S. militarism abroad, the language that the Grand Rapids Police Department is using to recruit faith leaders is the exact same language, the exact same kind of language that the U.S. Army and the CIA were using in manuals to train foreign soldiers in counterinsurgency. This may sound extreme to equate the GRPD's recruitment of faith leaders to techniques that have been used in counterinsurgency, But to dismiss such a claim would be naive. The Grand Rapids Police Department sees the public, particularly members of the public who are opposing business as usual policies, as insurgents, as people who are a potential threat to order. In the Public Safety Committee meeting mentioned above in his article, Chief Payne stated that he had reached out to the group Justice for Black Lives about getting a permit for their rally march to City Hall. Chief Payne stated that groups like JFBL need to get permits if they want to do things in a lawful and orderly fashion. In other words, the GRPD wants to be notified and therefore have as much control as possible for when there is any demonstration, protest, or active resistance that challenges business as usual. Let me add here, my opinion, permitting for a rally is a violation of the First Amendment. Bingo. You have the right to assemble, period, end of story. I went head to head with the city event planner over this. This woman harassed me to the point where if it weren't, if, I almost called the Michigan State Police because I was so over it. She called mm-hmm. me so many times when I was organizing a rally, threatened me with everything she could think of for not wanting a permit. Because she found it on Facebook and decided to call me and, and tell me that, she, that I needed to do this. And I'm like, no, 
I know what the Constitution says. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go meet my friends on a sidewalk. I can do that if I want to. Mm -hmm. I told everybody to meet me on the sidewalk. That's where we're going. (laughs) I'm not getting a permit. I'm not paying you. We're going to protest the police, so we don't want them to show up. We don't want them to help us. And the woman wouldn't drop it. It was horrible. I ended up giving the or or the event to somebody else. And mm-hmm. but now, if they're not having the clergy ride in patrol cars with them, they're gonna fly drones over the city and spy on you. They've been doing this. I guess is there a new? What's the new story with the drones? Well, Grand Rapids Police does not have drones. So whose have they been using? They have been using Kent County Sheriff, Michigan State Police. I've got the story here. This is Donovan Long writing for Wood Television. They sure had drones the day we protested the Proud Boys here a couple weeks ago. Yep, there were three they, four of them they've had drones around. at every That's, event. And that was, would be in GRPD jurisdiction. I guess the sheriff can go in there. I don't Directly know. Directly over yeah. the, oh, yeah, they work together. But Yeah, and the state police jurisdiction is everywhere. So yeah. why does Grand Rapids Police Department need them if they've got well, them there and there? Well, I'll tell you here in a second. Uh, This is, again, Donovan Long for Wood TV. They'll fly high and look low, but from the sky they'll serve a major purpose for the Grand Rapids Police Department. Police Chief Eric Payne said, quote, we need to break this cycle of violence, end of quote. Well, here's here's the clue to break the cycle of violence. Stop training people to be violent. That's for starters. Number two, people need to be paid better. You want to get rid of crime? Right here you go. Pay people better. Yeah. Simple, simple, simple solutions to simple problems. I'd like to know where all these guns are coming in from. Oh, are they coming in through the gun shops that y'all deregulated? You could yeah. go there, too, and start there if you want to yeah. end the violence. Yeah. Payne said he's working to add drones to his force, but it's going to be a challenge to get his plans off the ground. Uh, he said, quote, we're stretched thin. We have to make sure we have personnel to be able to fly them and to monitor them. End of quote. <sighs> Oh. Well, yeah, because nobody wants to be a cop anymore because guess what? They're... Oh, But they are. Everybody's a cop now. That's the thing. How much more personnel can they possibly have? Everywhere I go, I'm seeing them. Brand new cars all over. Women, men, mostly white, mm-hmm. but cops everywhere. And those are just the ones that are dressed in, in marked cars. Mm-hmm. And we all know there's plenty of unmarked, privately contracted officers or, on the Or street. lightly marked cars like what right. some like, of the sheriff's department yeah. de- have you seen some cruisers. of these now? oh yeah they don't like Lightly. barely be able to see the name on the side it's like a see, I haven't seen those. brown type print on a black truck so where you can't see it yeah some of them are until you're right like, up on it yeah some of them are almost like purposely like exactly. i don't even know how to explain it is it. purposely oh no it's it, all it's on purpose <laughs> but some of them are like i don't even know how to explain it like it blends in with the paint color yeah definitely uh, other agencies like the Michigan State Police and the Kent County Sheriff's Department already uses drones. A Michigan State Police trooper shared photos taken by his department's drone with News 8, which they've got photos on the story here that Donovan Long did. He said he used one to document significant fire damage in a home since it was unsafe for fire crews to survey the damage in person. Why wouldn't the fire department do that? You would think, because they don't have the drones, all the cops That's have them. That's my point. Give it to the fire department. <laughs> Those are the guys with courage that we trust. Michigan State Police said it has a total of five drones statewide. Meanwhile, Payne said he's not it. yet ready to specify how many drones his department would need to be successful. Quote, we'll land on a number between 1 and 10 that would allow us to utilize them in the most effective way. End of quote. Can we Michigan talk State ab- Police has five drones. I don't believe state. they have all body cams, do they? No, they don't. They can't afford them, they said. The co- they were cost prohibitive. I can go to Farm and Fleet right now and pick one up for, I think, 40 bucks. But they're cost prohibitive. They need drones, not body cams. I'll have to look up. Because they want to watch us. They don't want us watching them. I'll have right. to look up exactly. the price of police-grade uh, body cams because you can find that on the Internet. Use a cheap one. Yeah. I don't care at this well, point. Use something. The price of a drone, of a videotape. You know Come it's on. a tenth of what they're paying for it because they're paying sure. a private contractor that they hand chose. You want to know how much he wants to spend on this drone program? Not, not just the drones, but also people to operate these things? Three hundred thousand dollars. And keep in mind, they're eliminating all of our jobs within the city and the police department and everywhere else. Yeah. The only thing they're going to have yeah. are officers, and well, they won't need as many once they're all wearing these body suits that are like, you know, robots. Here, here I'm going. I'm going to get you fired up here, Katie. 
Aside from finances, he said he aims to steer public perception as he understands some may be concerned with an invasion of their privacy. When asked about those concerns, Payne said, quote, listen to how we are going to utilize them, end of quote. He then added, quote, they are not just going to be camping out over someone's neighborhood or backyard. We're using them as surveillance. They will be used intentionally for specific incidents in the city, end of quote. Sure they are. That's a play on words. Sure they yeah. are. Yeah. specific. Perception. Yeah, specific incidents in the city. We're going to put it right over Franklin and Eastern and not notice the guy with the noose in the window. But anything yeah. else that happens right there, they're going to notice. Oh, by the way, that guy took the noose out of the window. He said, that, you want to you know his explanation for why he put the noose in there? Did you hear this? I didn't hear this. Just he said that the reason for the news, it was a form of protest against corrupt politicians. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Payne says police will use the drones to cut down on response times, help monitor violent crimes, track car chases, survey crime scenes, navigate traffic reconstruction, and help with search and rescue missions. The top cop also specified when a search warrant would be needed in order to use a drone to investigate a crime scene. He said, quote, these incidents are occurring during public places, so you would not need a search warrant for them. If we were to use it for a private residence, we would have to seek the approval through a search warrant signed by a judge, end of quote. Yeah. So anything uh, we do in public can now be surveilled and recorded by the Grand Rapids Police Department. Now, I want you to think about things like, how this could affect financially things that you're doing, right? Um, Mm -hmm. So if a person is collecting unemployment. Yeah. As of right now, you have to show that you're looking for work. Yes. Now, if you say that you are applying for jobs in person at a certain location, Mm -hmm. okay, and then they wanted to prove you weren't, could they use this? That's a good question. It seems like they could. I can't see why they couldn't. So these are the little things that people don't think about. Yeah, that's just one example. You know, anything you say, though, anything you do that's that's official can absolutely be tracked now. And and they can pull in some stuff that nobody ever thought even existed to prove it. They Uh, fly over protests. If you step off the curb on the street. Right. Or did you step onto private property? Yeah. Yeah. Before, if nobody saw it, you would still be okay. But Mm -hmm. now they can go back three days later. Yep. Yep. By the way, the Grand Rapids Police Department intends to hold town hall meetings. They were originally scheduled for August, but got pushed back to September because of scheduling conflicts. Uh, they have not announced any specific dates or locations it yet. It doesn't for matter these. because they won't actually answer any of your questions. They won't allow you to talk for longer than two seconds. And if they, if you do, they'll find some other way to come and, harass and, and intimidate you later. And yeah, exactly. All right, I guess we need to go ahead right into our next segment, so we might as well just go ahead and play the appropriate music. Stop. Hammer time! Oh, yeah, it's hammer time. It is time to drop the hammer on the douchebag of the week, and once again, we have two winners this week, so anytime we have two winners, we also have to play this. The double douche. Who is that guy? Gentlemen? Wade Garrett. Holy shit. Exactly right. So here's what Wade Garrett is serving up on a platter this week. Winner number one, restaurant owner Tony Roman. I have this story. This is Vicki Vargas and Jonathan Lloyd writing for KNBC Television out of Los Angeles. This is dated July 26th. The sign on a window at a Huntington Beach restaurant might require a double take. Instead of the mask must be worn signs that became commonplace around California in an effort to stem the spread of the coronavirus, the sign taped to the window at Basilico's Pasta e Vino reads, Proof of being unvaccinated required. It's one illustration of the backlash that continues against coronavirus vaccines in parts of Orange County and around California. Owner Tony Roman told NBC LA he is willing to pledge his restaurant as a constitutional battleground. In a written statement to KNBC, he said, quote, Our American way of life is under attack. 
And I feel blessed to be on the front lines of this battle in defense of liberty and freedom, willing to put everything at risk for it, pledging our business as a constitutional battleground since day one of the lockdowns on March 19, 2020. We have never complied with any restrictions since, and when the tiny tyrants go on the attack with new mandates, we fire back launching new missiles of defiance. And with the new and aggressive push for mandatory vax policies, we couldn't resist, so we are sending a message of our own. Hopefully most are smart enough to read between the lines. Otherwise, we will just sit back and have fun watching their heads explode over it. End of quote. Sounds like he needs a visit from the health department and probably needs to have his food service license permanently revoked. That'll fix him. He sounds like a Looney Tune. Yeah, exactly. I'd be really scared about eating there. Yeah. yeah. So, Again, the that's, why, that's why he should probably have his uh, food service license revoked. You can't If he's going to avoid this, what kind of uh, procedures in the back are not being done? Uh, is there cross-contamination happening back there? Well, the conservatives don't worry about food protection, right? They don't worry about any protection that the government right. supplies. They, they don't, don't need, need it. regulations. They don't need yeah. no stinking protection. Uh-huh. Yeah. They don't, they don't even want you to use protection when you have sex. So there you go. It was not clear whether the restaurant is actually checking visitors' vaccine status. The restaurant previously declared itself a mask-free zone and remained open when many restaurants stopped indoor dining in March 2020. That's according to the L.A. Times. They're taking a much different approach at the Central Justice Center in Santa Ana. The presiding judge there said masks must be worn in the building after two COVID cases over the weekend. The location is the second courthouse in Orange County to require masks again after loosening guidelines earlier this year as case counts improved. The new administrative order will be in effect for two weeks. The vastly different responses to the pandemic come as Orange County reported another 1,351 COVID-19 infections Monday, a figure that includes numbers from the weekend. Also as of Monday, there were 194 people hospitalized in the county due to COVID, up from 156 on Friday. What is wrong with these people? You know, there there was a story I just read that there's people showing up in doctor's offices in Missouri wearing disguises so that their neighbors don't recognize them going in to get a COVID vaccine because they're afraid of the backlash they're getting. This is a legit news story. That's the Trumps, dude. <laughs> oh. Really? Please, doctor, please don't tell my neighbor that I got vaccinated. Trump snuck in. Yeah. They don't. I mean, theoretically, he did. They, they don't Hey, by the way, before that. we leave the, the douchebag here. Yeah. Wasn't last week's douchebag Leaf, the sheriff? Darleaf, yep. Do you see what he did this week? No, I haven't. There's an article in the Columns Gazette that a woman who was in charge of the Dominion machines in that county was approached by two detectives, I think it said, and quizzed aggressively on the procedures, the test results, this, that, on and on. She said, she admitted, in quotes, I cooperated. The headline said, a director of Dominion Machines in Kalamazoo County says to detectives, over my dead body will I hand over any information. So I call, I called the and this is in, I think it was in the Grand Arbor's Press. It was. Your story contradicts your headline. Yeah, I go, wait a second. <laughs> you give the impression that she had something to hide. Mm-hmm. That she was hiding information. And guess who's behind sending this detective? Leaf. Yeah. And she, she goes, she goes, I want to know who's paying for this. Who is paying for this? Is the, the county sheriff? Was it an actual paying? detective? Was it a private? What was it? The, was it the was it the DTE? Was it the DTE guy? That's exactly what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. One in the same. I'm telling you, the pair of military in America right now works for the energy companies. And the newspaper Madigan called. You know, the puppet said, "We'll get right back. I'll, we will get the author of the story, and they will call." And her phone hasn't hasn't rang, rang yet. No, We're all still holding our breath. No. <laughs> No, I would say at that point, just drive down to their offices, but I don't think there's anybody there. Do, yeah, do they even have offices anymore? Oh, they yeah. have the, the um, the new place, right? Well, are you talking about the Grand Rapids mess? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, inside a DeVos owned building, by the way. Mm. But just leave. What a jackass. He is, mm-hmm. he's worse than that. He is. 
but we got new ones. But new we're jackasses. but we're not done. We have winner number two this week. Once again, winning another douchebag of the week award, Donald Trump. I have this. This is Max Greenwood writing for The Hill. This is dated July 29th. Donald Trump lashed out of Senate Republicans Thursday after the upper chamber voted to take up debate on a bipartisan infrastructure package, accusing Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell and Rhinos, short for Republicans in name only, of surrendering to Democrats. In a statement, Trump said, quote, under the weak leadership of Mitch McConnell, Senate Republicans continue to lose. He lost Arizona. He lost Georgia. He ignored election no, fraud, did, and he doesn't fight. Now he's giving Democrats everything they want and getting nothing in return. No deal is better than a bad deal. Fight for America, not for special interests and radical Democrats. Rhinos are ruining America right alongside communist Democrats. End yeah. of quote. The oldest cliches. Yeah. If, ever had. if the son of a bitch ever picked up a dictionary and looked at the definition of communist, you'd probably see his own face in it. you got to be able to spell Cause, communist cause to find it guess, in the guess dictionary. Who, who are his buddies? Kim Jong-un, Vladimir Putin. Yeah. And you call Democrats communists? <laughs> You are a loser. You are an orange, small penis loser. See, the problem is wannabe. that he is sitting there and pontificating against the police. One who gave testimony hours ago, literally a few days ago, that he had a heart attack, that he actually still suffers from the heart attack, went through this gruesome medical array of pain infliction that he went through, and Trump called him a that's that's what this is about though see because mm -hmm. by doing that by trump calling that guy a pussy now They're you've right. got all of us over here on the defund the police movement suddenly empathizing with the police officer mm -hmm. right it's I, strategic I, I understand that and and i think that's absolutely correct at the same time i don't think trump realizes his own uh value no, in no that. i think he is being manipulated He's very much with the same data that they've stolen from us. Yeah, they've taken from him, and they are controlling him. Right. To and he he has so much power, but it's not him wielding it. That's the thing. And it's, yeah, he's it's, a it's, right. <laughs> That's exactly it. No. Celebrity <laughs> in charge. I don't think that not, word can be used on the air. So let's check I'll that one to, out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here's the thing, and Jack, you kind of mentioned it before we started recording. I'll elucidate it a little bit here. This is the same tactic that Republicans use with the military. We're pro-military. We're pro-police. Until the rubber hits the road, and then where do you see them? They're not around. It's oh, true. let's see. Soldier gets injured, gets a limb blown off from an IED. Where's the Republicans? They're pro you don't war, see They're pro-weapons manufacturing. They're pro-profit. Okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> They're not pro soldiers. There you go. <laughs> they are pro industrial military complex. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And I mean, if they can make some dollars for and the health insurance industry or the healthcare industry or the pharmaceutical companies at the same time, that's just lining their pockets. And, and, no more. and let me again, they are not pro police. They are pro military Violence. industrial complex because the cops are getting all the military stuff now yep. so there well, you they're, go they're lump them in police one of them has his knee on a black man's neck for i don't know how many minutes yep i mean white supremacy is another heck they'll, of a they'll support lining. that guy all day long yep yeah unbelievable stuff so wow what what a pair this week so Tony Roman and Donald Trump, congratulations on winning your awards, and yeah. we have this message for you. Don't be a douchebag. Yeah, that's right. You both need to stop being douchebags, especially Trump, because th this is getting old. I don't know how many awards I'm going <laughs> to send to him. He's probably a candidate for douchebag of the year already, and we're not even done with July yet. Yeah, like three years <laughs> running, I think. <laughs> I think so, actually, now that you mention it. <laughs> oh, God. I don't want to leave uh, yet. i got a couple more minutes uh, just before the show ends. I have to help a relative. 
Yeah. But I did see that the amount of ice that melted in Greenland, uh, this is incredible. They have calculated mm. in one week would cover Florida with two inches of water. Okay. Wow. One week of ice melting. We're looking at 100 degrees every day in the west. The weirdest, hottest weather. Germany, China. This is peak. Like this is really hitting the fan right to- now, isn't it? Tokyo, the Olympics. The yeah. the one tennis player. They literally had to carry him off the court, and he said, "If I die, are you guys responsible?" Oh my gosh, it's that hot there. Is yeah. Okay, I haven't looked at the temps there. I've, there's been so much, and I'm. To be honest, I lost my phone for two days, so I've been completely out of touch with reality. <laughs> but yeah, it's. I'm watching the storm warning the other night, two nights ago. Yep. It was crazy because I go and look on Facebook and the news organization had actually typed in, going to be some strong winds tonight um, with possible damages. So if you are in a home where there is only one wall between you and the outside, move to a more interior bedroom. <laughs> Tell the kids that you're doing a camp out. It'll be fun. And... I just went, oh, my gosh. I've, I've been through so many storms in my life. I've never heard them say in a thunderstorm warning, well, they if, you are, if there is only one wall between you and outside, move to an interior room. And I went, I thought of my kids who live in apartments, and there is mm-hmm. no interior room. Both of them are on a wall that yeah. goes to outside. They're on the lake shore. So I'm going. They know it's coming, the, Yes, they know it's coming, and it's coming, like, not next year. Yep. Like, Maybe this week. And it's mm-hmm. not just that. The flooding. Look at your elevation. Look at where you live. I'm starting to look now and notice what's higher and what's not. And some the people are not prepared. They made in the 80s. They've just made a statement. They doubled were, in severity. Yes. It they completely yep. underestimated yep. By, what we're about to walk into. By the way, Jack, you have somebody new to beat up over at Wood TV. Did you see this news, guys? No. Oh, Herb? No. No. Ellen Baca is the new chief meteorologist at Wood Television. Oh, I didn't oh, really? see that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, by the way, Ellen has been a guest of this show. She she came on after a tornado hit Portland, Michigan a few years ago. She was the first one to accurately predict that a EF, I believe it was an EF1 or an EF0 tornado had struck that area. She She beat the National Weather Service. Yeah. Nice. I, I like her. Yeah, Ellen. Ellen's a good gal. Uh, by the way, I Bill bet. Steffen is now the chief meteorologist emeritus. So he's pretty much as retired, but he's staying on the air through retirement. So this this will be interesting to see uh, what happens here. I'm I'm actually surprised he retired. Uh, uh, Jim Gurner, who used to be a host of this show, we talked years ago that. He had played golf with Craig James, who was the previous chief meteorologist of Wood TV. And he asked Craig, he says, when's Bill going to retire? And Craig looked at him and said, never. He loves this stuff too much. He's <laughs> never going to retire. Well, emeritus is the, the, the definition of emeritus is basically working while you're retired. <laughs> so... Uh, again, congratulations to Ellen Baca. Well, uh, if anybody deserves this, she does. Through that. Yep. We want to get to this next story here. This is, again, Wood Television. We, we've we talked about uh, Lisa Posthumous Lyons, the current Kent County clerk on, uh, on the show before. She's a former state lawmaker. Several years ago, we blistered her because on the floor of the Michigan legislature, she was calling union representatives for the teachers hogs and pigs. Pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered, direct quote. Well, her brother is now also a state representative. He's gotten into some trouble. Again, this is Wood Television. A West Michigan state representative will spend 15 days behind bars for drunkenly crashing his car. Representative Brian Posthumus, Republican of Cannon Township, pled guilty Friday to operating while intoxicated. He was sentenced to 15 days in jail, 15 days community service, and 24 months probation. According to the police, he rolled his 2007 Jeep Cherokee on McCabe Avenue near Four Mile Road in Ada Township on Friday, April 30th. Dashboard and body camera video from the Kent County Sheriff's Department shows Posthumus was cooperative with the deputy leading up to his arrest. He obeyed and complied with all field sobriety tests. He was asked to take a breathalyzer. 
He blew a .12, which is uh, one and a half times the legal limit. The, apparently, this is not the first time he was arrested in 2013 for OWI as well. Yeah, that's not surprising. <laughs> Uh, and, and by the way, both Brian and Lisa are the children of Dick Posthumus, the former lieutenant governor of Michigan. Right. So Grand Rapids. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> pretty much. Pretty much. And then one more story I want to get to. This We've talked about this lawmaker in Oregon. We can now call him a former lawmaker. I have this story. This is Cameron Jenkins writing for The Hill dated July 28th. Oregon State Representative Mike Neerman, who in December held open doors for right-wing protesters storming the state's Capitol building, on Tuesday said that though he pleaded guilty to charges he faced as a result of that day, he still does not believe that he did anything wrong. The 57-year-old made his remarks during an interview with conservative talk show host Lars Larson following his sentencing. He's told Larson, quote, I don't think I committed a crime and I don't think I did anything wrong, end of quote. By the way, they got him on video doing all this. Of course. Uh, He was charged with two misdemeanors, first degree official misconduct and second degree criminal trespass in May. He was sentenced by a Marion County judge Tuesday to 80 hours of community service, $2,900 in fines, He's also banned from entering the Oregon Capitol building for 18 months. Uh, And by the way, he was kicked out of office. He was he was expelled from the Oregon legislature for this. So, yeah, 80 hours of community service. As I said before, we started recording. I would have given him 80 years hard labor. Yeah. I mean, these are the people that should have actually that should actually be getting punished. You know, people that had responsibility and shunned it or just blatantly went against it you know Mm -hmm. but instead they're going after all these people that were just easily manipulated into running into a building and i don't understand how that's going to help anything well because that that's the they're they're getting the easy prey they don't want to go after the big time exactly that's scary (laughs) that's scary because you know the more that we see people get upset about this and their sympathy grows for these poor Capitol Police officers the more that they're going to have a case to try to build against other protesters next time we have a legitimate thing to protest. Yeah, that that is always, well, it's always been a possibility. Now, will they follow through on it? That will be next. Kong. That'll be next to see here in this country. But yeah, it's happening in Hong Kong and everywhere else in the world. Oh, boy. Well, we are out of time for this week. We'll be back next week. I'm Darren Gibson. I'm Katie Steele. For Jack Prince and Kristen Cook, please support the First Amendment. The stations that carry Southpaws do not necessarily share the opinions expressed on the show. Southpaws is protected by the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and is copyrighted by Big D Entertainment. All rights reserved.